is still here with us. Our next speaker is Brian Kozak. He's an alumnus of Purdue. He's been mining Bitcoins for over a year now. He's going to share with us his experiences. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Bitcoin mining process and kind of my experience uh, Bitcoin mining and a little bit of the all. Yeah, that doesn't work. That one doesn't work. Yeah, maybe get the. Do the other hand though. I know you're paying. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, what I want to talk about today is Bitcoin mining and kind of my experience over the last uh, 18 months or so with it. Um, my presentation today is a little bit more technical, um, and I hope everyone could uh, kind of follow along. I start off kind of talking about the Bitcoin mining process, and then talk about some of the miners that I brought with me today. I actually have two older style uh, ASIC miners with me on the table here, and they are actually mining as we speak, and have been mining since I got here this morning, about 10 this morning. And a little bit later in my presentation, I'll just kind of show you uh, what they've done uh, so far. I'm also going to talk about the return of investment on a miner, because uh, that's an issue where a lot of people uh, make some mistakes in uh, recalculating that, and where it's pretty easy to kind of get screwed over, if you will, on um, ordering stuff or ordering miners um, that may not necessarily return all the money they paid for them. And I'll kind of close today with some discussion and a little bit of warning of some um, scams and some some sh shady issues that are going on uh, with Bitcoin mining. So my experience, I started in March of 2013, uh, right before the, well, actually two bubbles ago now, um, right before the, the April bubble of like $260 or so. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I learned about it, but as soon as I learned about it, I was, I was definitely interested and hooked on it. Um, during that time, I actually used two of the graphics cards in my computer to mine for several weeks, um, actually a couple months at that point. And the difficulty was, uh, when I started, was about seven and a half million. Difficulty is just a function of how much hashing power and how many miners there are on Bitcoin network. Um, as of this morning, it's about 36 billion, so over a thousand times uh, more difficult increase um, in, in mining, and about a thousand times more hashing power or miners on the network as well. Currently, I'm on my fourth ASIC miner and probably my last just because of a lot of technical issues relating to the hash rate and miners and um, kind of the, the centrally located mining facilities and data centers that I'll talk about in a little bit. My experience has been a very slight return of investment. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many coins I've um, spent on, on mining equipment versus how many um, I made. Um, I have those numbers at home and it's, it's been very slight, maybe half a coin or so. Um, so not much in terms of the risk um, that I had to put in because uh, in December I actually spent 10, coin, 10 bitcoins on 10 different miners and it was barely made money back. Um, in my experience, I've had better luck buying and just holding coins than trying to generate them. It's kind of a quick overview of Bitcoin mining. It's a fundamental part of Bitcoin as miners will find the next block in the blockchain. And they accomplish this by solving the uh, proof of work algorithm. And that's a, a SHA -S -S or SHA 256 algorithm, which is actually very hard to solve, but easy to verify. And one of the, the best ways, if you will, to solve the algor this algorithm is by uh, brute force attacking it. So just guessing as many times as fast as you can to solve the problem. If you do solve this problem, the current block reward uh, is 25 bitcoins plus the transaction fees 
which varies from about 0 0.01 to about 0 0.1 uh, Bitcoin um, per block. Originally, the block, each block was worth 50 Bitcoins, and due to the halving about almost two years ago now, it's down to 25 Bitcoins per block, and we're about halfway through the current halving which will take place in about August of 2016, where the reward will drop to about 12.5 Bitcoin. The difficulty, which is how hard it is to solve the next block in the blockchain, um, and the, actually taking a step back, the, the blocks in the blockchain are generated um, targeted rate every 10 minutes or so. And in order to keep this 10 minute rate, the network um, increases or decreases the difficulty about every two weeks or so, relating how, um, how much or how fast these blocks are generated. So back when I said uh, I started mining about 7 million difficulty, and now it's about 36, 37 million or so, um, the block generation time is still, still 10 minutes, but because there's about 1,000 times the amount of hashing power on the network, the difficulty in solving the next block is 1,000 times harder. And this difficulty can either increase or decrease depending on how fast or how slow a block is being generated. Um, over the last year and a half to two years, uh, the difficulty has gone up uh, significantly and hasn't decreased. Since I think early 2013. So when Bitcoin started, the easiest way to generate coins was through the CPU in your computer. Um, it was the difficulty was at one or two, and you could generate 50 coins, 100 coins, a couple hundred coins uh, a day by just running it on a desktop or a laptop. As the network grew, more and more people started generating coins the more difficult it became, the more specialized hardware was needed. In about 2010, the summer of 2010, um, some miners decided to try and use their GPUs or graphics cards in their computers as a way to increase the guesses per second or hashing power uh, in order to solve this proof of work algorithm. And GPUs were used up until about mid last summer. Kind of a, the next step in that were FPGAs, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays, which were reconfigured chips used for uh, different processes to kind of lower the power consumption of mining, but keep a significant hash rate. Currently, the type of miners that are used are ASICs which are application-specific integrated circuits, which are specifically designed um, computer chips to solve the Bitcoin algorithm. And that's all they do all day for their entire life. So if you try to use one of these miners right here as a video processor for your computer or something to run a uh, different program on, it, it wouldn't work at all. And ASICs really started to become more prevalent from about 2013, the summer, um, of 2013 to uh, the current day. This chart right here just shows a comparison of a little bit of different hardware and the power consumption versus the hash rate of them. So in the early days, a CPU uh, was generating a hashing away about 0 0.01 giga hash which is 0 0.01 uh, billion guesses per second to solve uh, that algorithm. Uh, they use about 100 watts of power, so not very efficient. GPUs were a little bit better in terms of hash rate, uh, about 0.65, uh, used significant power, uh, but that's, pretty, that's kind of where the FPGAs um, came in. They used uh, a little bit less hash rate than a graphics card or GPU but significantly less power. And then when you finally get into the different generation of ASIC chips, uh, they started to definitely increase the hash rate and lower the power consumption on those. So 
These miners that I have with me are from the Generation 3. They are actually the Rock Miner R box. And there, two of them are hashing away at about 32 or 35 giga hash a piece and using about 40 watts, 38 watts or so of power. So a pretty good um, watt per giga hash efficiency. This chart just kind of shows the all time hash rate, um, showing a huge spike kind of starting in the summer of 2013 and just going exponentially higher um, over the last eight months or so. A better chart um, shows the same information but in a logarithmic scale. So going from about 2009, um, there's not many people on the Bitcoin network um, other than Satoshi um, mining and a couple of very early adopters. And then once GPU mining started uh, in the summer, the hash rate just climbed rather exponentially. And because the Bitcoin network wants to keep the block generation time at every 10 minutes, the difficulty also increases exponentially. So it doesn't matter if there's one miner, a million, or a, a billion people mining on the network with as much hashing power as you can, it doesn't matter that the block still needs to be generated at a rate of every 10 minutes. So for the first 10 months, 11 months or so, the difficulty was at one for the Bitcoin uh, network. Um, once it started taking off, that we heard a couple of talks ago, um, when people started proving that Bitcoin was an actual concept and started trading it for money, people realized, hey, I have an idle computer at home, or I'm not using my computer at night, might as well make some money off of it. And as kind of Bitcoin became greater and greater momentum, you'd see that the difficulty started to um, increase up until, like I said, about the summer, when people realized that they could use graphics cards to increase their generation um, of coins as well. So, pretty interesting um, chart just showing the overall uh, difficulty of block generation. When I was talking about a little bit earlier about the difficulty increasing, this is just a, um, a little quick chart over the difficulty over the last eight months or so. Um, the amount of hashing power has grown almost, <coughs> almost 10 times. So a huge increase in the last eight months or so. But it's also interesting to note that the block generation time is still at 10 minutes and the price has dropped almost uh, from $900 or so to just over $300. So I'll talk a little bit more about that and some problems facing uh, Bitcoin is that you're still paying for rental space in a data center. Uh, you're still paying for electricity to run these machines. You're still, still paying for new machines because as more and more people get on the network, the difficulty increases and it's kind of a zero sum game because if I add more power, that means I get maybe a temporary increase in my Bitcoins, whereas someone else that just spent $10 million to build their huge data center will get left out. There's two different ways to mine Bitcoins. The first way, which was prevalent in the early days, and I say the early days, from about 2009 until uh, 2011, maybe early 2010, was through solo mining. And if you were to find a block, that those 50 coins or 25 coins were all yours. And that was most prevalent when there was low difficulty or a high hash rate. And a lot of luck was required during that time because, again, you are competing with everyone else on the network uh, to find those coins. Or you could also play the odds if you like, um, which I'm actually kind of doing at home because these miners are pretty much at their end of their life. And um, I'm gambling a little bit um, at home. The current number of giga hashes on the network is um, 
about 280 million. And each of these boxes right here is about 35 giga hash. So I have about one in eight million chance of finding a block um, myself. Um, and I get to play that lottery you know, once every 10 minutes. And I have about one in 4,000 chance of finding a block at the current difficulty myself. Uh, current power draw on those is about 10 to 15 cents a day. So it's something interesting to do for uh, old body equipment. What most people do currently is what's called pool mining, is that you take all of your different miners as a group and try and find a block together. So a lot less luck is required because if you're part of a pool, let's say you are part of the Allegis pool down here in purple, they have about 5% of the Bitcoin network, which I'm currently mining on right now. And you share um, a percentage of whatever uh, hash rate it is at that current pool. So the demonstration that I have set up here is the rock miner R box, and it's about uh, 50,000 satoshis a day, uh, or about 20 cents. So you're not going to get rich off of this, uh, fortunately. And it costs about 12 cents a uh, day to run in power cost. <laughs> so this is just the miner uh, controller running right here. And you'll see it update about once every uh, three to five seconds or so. And based upon the current price and difficulty, each one of these may be uh, one, two, five satoshis or so. So again, not a, not a huge amount of um, money being generated by this, but it's also a very small, very, very small part of the overall Bitcoin network. It looks like over the last um, 15 minutes or so, there are about 65 giga hashes, 65 um, billion guesses per second. Um, which, I'll take a quick second. Like, if I were to try and solo mine a block, I'd find a block, um, I think, in about 30 years, <laughs> guessing at 65 billion times a second. So, it's an insanely difficult problem uh, to solve by yourself. And just coming back to the main computer here, uh, this is actually the Allegis pool. Um, I actually set up this account earlier today to show the, um, the mining um, since I started here this morning about 10 o'clock. Um, so we should find a block hopefully in the next uh, hour or so, and then I'll have a total of about 15,000 Satoshi, so about three cents maybe. So let's say you wanted to try mining yourself. Um, one of the quick calculations that you could do and one of the most common mistakes that I found and I made it myself uh, when I first started out was calculating your return of uh, investment. So I created a quick hypothetical situation right here. Like, let's say Bitcoin is worth $300 and a miner is $600 or two Bitcoins. Difficulty will increase um, over some time period, say six months to a year, uh, 10 to 100 percent or 100 times, um, the Bitcoin miner is no longer profitable both to being run. Uh, but Bitcoin is now $1,000 a coin, a nice uh, increase from 300. But the miner over its lifetime only mined 1.5 Bitcoin. So you have $1,500 total, but overall you lost money because you would have better would have been better off just buying Bitcoin at $300 and holding them. I've actually seen uh, many people make this mistake and saying, well, I only paid $600 for it, now I'm $1,500, I made money. Well, not exactly. And a little more detailed example here, um, these two miners are actually still for sale but the return of investment on them is extremely small. Um, they cost about $34 as of um, last night or a couple days ago. 
Bitcoin, 350, maybe a little less. Uh, current difficulty, 36 billion. Your power draw, which is another thing that a lot of people don't take into account, is that mining cost takes power. It takes power to run machines, and it also takes power if you're mining during the summer to cool your machines to make sure they don't overheat. So theoretical, theoretical earning is just over 50,000 Satoshi a day for one of these miners, which means it'll take uh, 568 ideal days to make that money back uh, at the current difficulty. But because the difficulty, at least currently, is increasing almost every time, you'll never make any of, any of the money you paid for these miners back. There are a couple of online calculators, uh, which I can talk to anyone um, who's more interested about it after my talk, a little bit more about it um, later today. And these calculators kind of go through some of these calculations for you by putting the overall uh, difficulty increases and their best estimate of increases overall. A couple of problems with the current mining situation is that because it's becoming more and more prevalent, more and more mainstream through adoption, uh, more, more, more people know about it, that means more people want to mine it and try and have a device that prints money. And mining is tending to be located near, um, near countries or near locations with cheap electricity. Because if you imagine like one watt of power per one giga hash, and you're talking about, you know, you need a thousand or a million, you know, lots of power to, you know, make any money in this. That's a huge amount of electricity. And why would you go to a place in Germany that pays, you know, 36, 35 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity when you can go to Washington State and you pay two cents through hydro or Iceland or Finland or something like that? And because the Difficulty is increasing dramatically over the last uh, year and a half or so. Mining is almost out of the reach of the, the average uh, miner, the average hobbyist who does it in their garage or backyard or computer room or, or something like that. Uh, my latest miner, which I probably make a little bit of money or at least break even on, is using 1,500 watts of power, which is essentially a space heater, which is a huge amount of power but because it's getting cold outside, I'm actually using that to partially heat my house. So instead of you know, wasting that money um, like running my furnace at, you know, at night or during the day when it's cold out, I'm actually recouping well, hopefully most of that money uh, through mining. Another thing to worry about and kind of issue is if you have a company that is selling a device that prints money, why would they sell it to you to begin with instead of just mining it themselves? And um, that's a, a big issue with a company called Butterfly Labs, which, uh, how many people have heard about that? Okay, about half the, half the group here. Um, they actually came out in 2011, 2012 or so, and they actually designed and built miners, but uh, essentially sold them on a pre-sale to um, the Bitcoin mining community and used everyone's money to essentially build these miners and mine them and then ship them out six months, a year, a year and a half late where the, the, the difficulties increased to a point where it wasn't even worth it to run it anymore. And one of the last things I want to talk about is a couple warnings. Um, before we kind of close here is that many manufacturers that I've found in Bitcoin mining uh, community over promise and under deliver. Uh, but Butterfly Labs, like we talked about, uh, KNC Miner, they've been around about a year, maybe a little, little bit longer. Uh, they first came out with their Jupiter and Saturn miners, which made a lot of people a lot of money, but they also um, kind of turned to the dark side, if you will, by uh, their latest miner that's you know, six months late. Black Arrow, I think they're either Russian or Chinese. They promised, you know, a great miner, uh, great price, you know, delivered in a couple weeks, but 
we failed to deliver on that one. Uh, Gaul miners, they are a uh, script miner, so like Light, Litecoin or Dogecoin. Um, be very careful of ordering through them. There's some talk that it may be a large Ponzi scheme. And another thing that's kind of come out in the last six months or so is cloud caching. So companies that say, yes, we have miners in stock, you know, you pay us with a credit card or PayPal or Bitcoin or whatever, and we will host them for you and run them for you and take care of everything. We'll just pay you at the end or pay you daily or whatever it is. And many of these are extremely shady to begin with. Uh, could be scams. A lot of them could be just straight out Ponzi schemes. And a lot of these cloud hashing companies, it's very hard to verify if they have actual mining equipment to back up what they say they do. And even if they do, you may never have a return on your investment with those. So now I'd like to have a discussion or some questions. Yeah? Uh, you made a pretty powerful case that Bitcoin really isn't worth mining on a hobbyist or an individual level anymore. Yes. Um, is there any altcoins that you'd even recommend that maybe even run on GPU or CPU? I'm not very familiar with many altcoins besides, besides like Litecoin or Dogecoin. Okay. And I really can't. I'm not sure on that. Okay. <coughs> Where do you see the future of mining? So, you know, you have these huge, huge installations in China and BitFury here in the United States. And if, if it continues like going up and up, I mean, eventually even they can't afford, I guess, to run. I don't know. But that's a good point. Like, I, I see within the next um, years, two years, um, more and more centrally located mining facilities, especially in areas of cheap electricity or cold climates or both. Uh, just because if you're talking about megawatts of power, that's a, a lot of power to cool, and it's a lot easier to cool it if you have a cold climate. Um, I don't really, currently I don't see any way around that up until the next happening, where if all of a sudden you had this huge data center that cost $20 million to build, and you know, having comes, and all of a sudden you're only making half the amount of coins just because that's the Bitcoin network. Um, and then the price, if it doesn't, Go away, yeah. Right. So do the, do these companies go away and then it's they could. mid size? I mean, what, what do you think? It really depends on the price and then the um, the well the price overall. I mean, the price kind of drives um, the amount of people and the difficulty because going back to this picture right here. You know, if you see, okay, we're going up maybe 10%, 15% or so, then all of a sudden in early October, it's like 1%, 3%. You know, well, what happened right there? The price dropped from 600 to 300. And if you have this huge data center that costs a you know, million dollars a day to run, and all of a sudden you're not making coins, or the coins you're mining aren't are worth it, worth the, the price, it'll just turn off your. Power. So each of those percentages is more computers both coming onto the network. That's right. Okay. So the uh, like February twenty eighth, um, the hash rate was uh, about twenty seven peta hash, which uh, not good with huge numbers. But a lot of guesses per second, <laughs> but you can see it from like February to you know last week. You know, it's ten times as many computers going on, which may not necessarily be more computers, but more efficient computers because, like, Generation One ASIC was ten watts per one gig of hash, um, whereas Generation Three is one watt per gig of hash. So your power consumption will be the same, but if you're adding more efficient chips, you get more. A better hash rate out of it. Is that a question? Yeah. Uh, so, two part question. Sure. Uh, one is Have you seen a greater increase in profit when using a multi pool as 
post just a normal pool. Uh, and uh, second part of the question is, uh, what are your thoughts on multi pools because they don't actually contribute to the uh, Bitcoin network? I have, um, unfortunately, limited experience in multi pool. I mean, I had a little bit when I was um, script mining with like Litecoin. Um, I don't, I don't really have a, I can't really comment on that. Sorry. Zach. Yeah, was there? Yeah. I was going to ask, what's a multi pool? Multi pool <laughs> is when your uh, the pool is mining the most efficient or the most profitable coin at that time. So it will have maybe four, ten different coin, like altcoins um, running at the same time. And the pool will switch between like Litecoin or uh, Dogecoin or um, or Bitcoin or something like that. Okay. Was there one in the back? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you think the central the trend towards the centralization of mining? Could be a problem for the growth of Bitcoin, and if you do, do you think there's any interesting solutions? Yes, I do think it's a problem because if you read Satoshi's white paper, he was talking about having decentralized nodes, um, decentralized mining to act as no single point of failure. So if you have a huge data, data center that's 15% um, of the Bitcoin network in Iceland, and Iceland all of a sudden says, we don't like that. That could be a, a problem with um, block time because all of a sudden, instead of like 10 minutes or so per block, uh, it's now you know, 12 minutes or something like that. And well, the difficulty will automatically adjust itself within about that two week time. Um, that, that could be a problem with uh, like confirmation time. And then what to do about that? That's kind of what I'm hoping the community could help everyone out on, because it's a def definitely a big issue, um, especially if the Bitcoin price were to rise um, significantly again. If you're talking about three thousand or you know ten thousand dollars a coin, all of a sudden it's like, hey, you know these things are now worth it to turn on again. Um, you know that could help out a little bit of it, but the, the biggest thing that I can think of is the next halving which is about 18 months, 20 months away, uh, 22 months away now. Yeah. Um, so have you heard of GigaHash IO and yes. how you can buy and sell hashing power within it? Are you familiar with that? Yes. Can you comment on that a little bit, what your thoughts are? Um, I would you say, say you said that. look out for scams. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, you don't I'm familiar with that. One, or uh, is that an okay one? Or, I guess, no. It's kind of what, what was said a little bit earlier today is that if you don't control the private key to your Bitcoin address, you don't really control it. Mm -hmm. Same thing can be said about mining power. Like I have you know, this miner with me today. This is mine. I could turn it on or trade it or give it to somebody else. Um, with the cloud hashing through GigaHash, um, I know they have a pretty significant, I think it's like 20% or 30% of the uh, Bitcoin network. So I'm reasonably assured that they have a lot of their um, miners and actual, actual hashing power physically there. But if you ever like, make a return on it, that's hard to say. But just from my own, own experience and kind of being involved in different forums and, and physical hardware for the last three years, that's 18 months or so, uh, it's, I, I would personally stay away from any kind of cloud hashing, no matter how good of a deal it sounds. Thank you. And if there's any more questions, um, I'd, be, I'd be in the back or outside. Um, you can just come up and, and talk to me. I'd be happy to talk to anyone uh, at length about this.